Hodgson put him on his back. Thurston, right foot kick, down the ground, into the in goal almost. Hodgson cuts it off. Hodgson taken by Norton. He took him late. Marshall skips away. Marshall skips away. Marshall's still going. Marshall's got Richards coming up outside. Now inside. Richards pursued. He pushes Johnson away. Boom. Tuesday, 2nd of April, 2024. Is that where we are? 2024, 2nd of April. It's not April Fool's Day. You're back for another episode of the Tiger Town Podcast with your hosts, Zach and Toby, brought to you by brought to you by Best On Ground Digital, bestongrounddigital.com. They are the digital marketing agency that looks after the little guy. They will not steer you wrong. Bestongrounddigital.com. Toby, here you go, on, mate. Hey? Mate, my heart has not stopped racing. Ooh, it yeah. was... Uh, you, should, the... um, you should probably get that looked at, mate. Oh, mate, uh, it does happen being a Tigers fan every once in a while. That's I don't true. Know if it, I don't know if it's never happened to you, but you know, maybe you're a little bit healthier in that retrospect than me. <laughs> in that, yeah, in that respect. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Hey, uh, I don't know whether you notice or not, but it is a Tuesday night. There was a Tigers game on a Monday afternoon yesterday, the Easter Monday clash, 17-16 West Tigers all over them, the Parramatta oh. Eels. Mate. mate, we're gonna we're going to go and dive in as deep as we normally do, mate. But tell me, very briefly, what did you think of the game? Uh, mate, I was thoroughly, thoroughly impressed by our defensive commitment. Ridiculously impressed. 30, 30 tackles on our own goal line in the space of what ten minutes. And we didn't let them through. Yep. Ridiculous. Right now, hat is off. For those watching YouTube, saw me take my hat off to Johnny Morris, our defensive coach. That was something special. You know, yep. yes, we had some great moments in attack, but it was all led by that platform. Defense was incredible. Everything went the Parramatta's way in terms of possession. Particularly early in that game, we got a little bit of possession back in the end. We ended up with only we ended up with forty seven percent, but at one stage, I think it was sixty six percent to thirty four percent, and this was yep. like thirty something minutes into the game. It was outrageous, and we were still leading. I think six four at that stage, uh, mate. Incredible. I mean, obviously, a bit of it was our own doing. Do you think we were entirely to blame for the possession? Do you think Parramatta played the possession game well? Um, the officials. I've got a few thoughts on that. What do you reckon? <laughs> yes, I think uh, I think you and I both have a few thoughts on that, but I'll let you delve into that side of the the coin there. But I think there was a myriad of things that you know we put ourselves under our, under pressure a bit. Yeah. Um, you know, silly offloads in our own twenty when they probably weren't on. When you know we were surrounded by eels defenders. Um, you know, I think. I think in that first 20 minutes, we maybe completed at 50%, not even that. So we put ourselves under a bit of pressure. Uh, I think that... I don't think the Eels played the possession game well at all. I don't think that that was their main intent, was to continuously regain possession. Uh, they looked like they were trying to score pretty consistently off every set. And as it comes down to officials, I will let you take this one. Uh, mate, it was good ac across the board generally, but the one-sided nature that the teams were refereed, and I'm talking specifically penalties, 10 penalties to two. Fuck off. Like, seriously, some the way the way and the timing of, of when we were pinged and how we were pinged and the nitpicking nature of it, I'm all for that if that was solely uh, our discipline. But you tell me... And you'd mentioned it in the chat. The amount of times we got pinged for being a toenail offside when Parramatta were doing it as much as us all freaking day, them not being square at marker was getting to ridiculous proportions at one point. And it was two rough infringements each. So two six, two, um, six against each. But yeah. mate, 10 penalties to two. Stop it. They got, yeah. did they get four penalty goal attempts? 
something like that. They were given four. four yeah. they were given four opportunities to tie the game back up, uh, or or push them that extra little bit ahead, and yeah. they kept taking us every every time we were down on their line, getting some ascendancy in defence. There was a penalty, and it was one of those situations like, oh, here it comes. And generally speaking, you would assume that clubs or teams in that situation, if they give away a penalty, one, yes, well, they are a little bit too too eager. But I think it happened two or three times in that particular situation. It's a joke. Like, it's a joke. You tell me that one team is that that bad disciplinary-wise in terms of um, giving away penalties? Go away. Um, he he just got sucked in by the combat crowd, this bloke, and he just blew. I was saying it live in the game to myself, out loud. Um, crowd yeah, penalties. But- he, but that's like, the thing too. Like, inexperienced ref, really shit house in this situation, in my opinion, at blocking the crowd out and refereeing the game on its merits. And that's how it manifested. And that's where the possession came from, that and our own ill discipline. But see, that's the thing. I, I wish I could sit there and agree with you that the crowd played a part of it, but I would easily say that that crowd was 50-50 yesterday in terms of Eels and Tiger supporters. They were both, I think the Tigers were probably more vocal than the Eels supporters were. So I don't really think that the crowd swayed his decisions that much. I honestly think, and this is something you and I have discussed on previous pods at length, is this unconscious bias. You know, we're a struggling club. We shouldn't, you know, be off our line as quickly as they are. So we we have to uh, be offside. Oh, Parramatta Eels, you know, they went to a grand final three years ago. Yeah, they're, they're probably right. I just think that there's that mentality because, like you said in the chat, I was, you know, I had to keep my uh, my curse words to a minimum because I was watching it with my two daughters. But I was fuming at how many times we were getting pinged and then literally the next set that we had possession, the Eels in front, like basically beside the ref, were two steps ahead. And I was just sitting there going like, I can't see how these standards continue to happen. It has been us, like we've we've been doing this pod now, it's our third year. And I think every third pod that we do, we bring up the exact same um, topic. And it can't be a coincidence. It can't be um, by chance that we keep bringing up that there is a... What's the word? There is some sort of, um, I guess, examples in the past where we can go back to and show everyone. But it's it's getting really frustrating still. Like when I say still, it's never stopped being frustrating. But we overcame adversity when we didn't have to. Yes, we put yeah. ourselves in a position to in terms of drop ball, you know, possession like that. Yep. Fair enough, that's on us. You but, cop that. Yeah, you cop that on the chin. Like you'll sit there and you'll you'll blame the the the, the silly errors and things like that. Yep. Be like, fair enough. Well, not fair enough, but that's on yep. us. That's not I've got nothing to do with them. But you can't continuously have these situations and be like, oh well, at least we won. Well, we should have won by a lot more if we did win because. When we were camped down, like, you also have a look at how many, like I said, they had like 30 tackles on our line, couldn't score. We had one. Our first set was a try. And then we just couldn't get back down there for the the next 30 minutes. Yeah. Because yeah, somehow exactly. we had... Yeah. Sometimes a game goes that way. But the real, the reality is this, in my opinion, <clears throat> is that in every single game, Teams on both sides commit a series of offences that never get picked up. Because if a referee picked up every person to the nth degree on everything, they, every indiscretion they do, every time they're a millimetre offside, every flat ball, the game would be horrible. Yeah. So both teams are committing offences. And so where, for me, that, that um, unconscious bias that you're talking about comes in, is in, in or how it manifests, sorry, is choosing when they put the whistle in the mouth for the poorer teams versus when they don't for the better teams. And that's something that I don't think that they have control over entirely as much as we say they don't. And I think, I think that that's how it manifests. And 
um, you know, let's say Parramatta uh, commit 50 indiscretions in a game and the Tigers commit 60 indiscretions in a game, that the whistle might only be blown for five penalties each or something like that. You know, they do let minor stuff go because you've got to, you got to let the game flow. You simply have to. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, the caveat to that is there is going to be teams that get away with stuff. But the balance of a ref, I think, is making sure that when it is getting too extreme or a team is gaining an advantage, that's when they blow the whistle. That's when it's a penalty or that's when whatever, whatever um, six again or whatnot is issued. So I think I think that's where it happens. Um, and like you said, you know, if we use the example of getting up off the line, <clears throat> we all know that touchies don't sit there uh, on the – on the 10 meter mark, every, every tackle they'll float in and out. Sometimes they're on the 10 meter mark. Sometimes they're back with the, the attacking side. Um, so they're not always calling them out. If a referee is seeing Parramatta get up in their face, they are used to seeing Parramatta get up in the face of it's not, it's not odd. It's not different. It's something this, their side has done for a period of time. They've had good line speed. They've had shooters, all this sort of stuff. So that's not going to trigger them into think, oh, they must have been offside, or I had a, I had a feeling someone was was offside to my left, and he shot up. Oh, that's okay. Parramatta are known for that. It, it was probably okay. It wasn't blatant in my periphery. I didn't notice. I'm not going to blow the penalty. West Tigers, double wooden spoon, passive side defensively for years on end. If somebody is up and you had that sixth sense in your periphery that someone may have been, you blow the, you blow the penalty because you're not used to that side doing that, and so. If you have a suspicion, like I said, 50 to 60 indiscretions, minor indiscretions a game, you might have a suspicion. Whereas if it doesn't impact the play negatively, if they don't shoot up and it becomes a blatant offside, maybe they don't blow it. Anyway, I'm going on a bit of a tangent, but I don't want to make this about the referees. But it's important to note because I think as a result of that win, as a result of the adversity that we both we put on ourselves, but also the issue with referee, um, rightly so, people are waxing lyrical about this the, the newfound grit and resilience in this side, which is friggin' awesome. Yeah. But it behooves us to mention this stuff because it is still ongoing. Mm. Um, and look, maybe I've just read it wrong and maybe it is a case of confirmation bias in that regard because we're still very scarred from that. Look, each win matters so much to us too. So every time a decision goes slightly against us or we don't get a 50-50, like we've been so starved of wins, like, that, like we said, we got teary-eyed when we won a game a year or two back. When we won a game. And so yeah. people get wonder why we get so up in arms. Oh, the refs are going to make mistakes. Just let it go. It's like, no, because so much for us, for years, so much is ridden on the result because we never get the result that every minor little 50-50 or indiscretion is bigger than Ben Hur. People want to know why Tigers are constantly, Tigers fans are constantly talking about the refs. Probably one part that unconscious bias we mentioned. mentioned. It's probably one one part because it matters so much more to us than other teams. Um, so anyway, I'm going to leave it there. What that did do, though, both our own errors and our own um, issues, and is it gave Para obviously a glut of uh, possession early on. Mate, you mentioned Johnny Morris. Now Johnny Morris obviously is uh, the defensive coordinator for the side, and obviously he's worked quite a lot on. Um, structures and, and whatnot and, and approaches to defence in certain situations and, and how they're approaching that. There's the other element, though, of uh, what we've been talking about recently, which is more of the individual effort areas. So that is, do I get up an extra half a yard? Do I hit with an extra couple of newtons of force? Uh, do I work a little bit harder in the wrestle for a half split second just to get that minor millimetre or two benefit out of it in the ruck? Do I do that all game? For me, that's where it was. Again, like last week, it wasn't necessarily the structures for me, although they struggled to strip us again. So the structures are definitely improved. They're not getting around us. No. Uh, but, yeah, for me, it's all the little things. Um, I was particularly impressed in the Sharks game with their kick pressure. I will say one negative before we, you go in and have a talk about what you liked from the effort defensive standpoint. I was disappointed with kick pressure on the weekend. I guess yep. I guess I'm getting my neg- negatives out of the way early because yeah, yeah. we're going to talk about this thing 360, and we're going to talk for a while because it was an awesome game. But yeah, yeah. Um, the, the kick pressure wasn't there, and I was both surprised and disappointed because I looked at that team sheet and I thought, with no Moses, who's the majority kicker, you got Talangi who barely kicked, you got Dylan Brown, and then Gutherson who kicked. I th- I'm thinking, mate, if you're going to pressure anyone, pressure the sides kickers who don't have their main kicker, whose halfback is out. 
Um, so we didn't quite do that, and we saw that they were able to get some decent kicks away, which was a shame. But, mate, um, other than that, what was your take on defence in particular? Well, I, I kind of want to, I guess, expand on that just a little bit because I will disagree somewhat to you in terms of the the kick pressure wasn't there. I believe what I saw in that first half, it was. And the evidence to me that they had to change tactic was if you have a look at the second half, Gutherson did every single kick. Now, they should have gone and um, you know, smothered him rather than focus on Dylan Brown. But Dylan Brown barely got a single decent kickoff. It was all Gutherson, all Gutherson. And it was mainly in that second half. Were we gassed from all that defense we did in the first half? Yeah, Absolutely. probably. Um, but I think that we did enough to have them switch tactics. And they talked about this in the Parramatta press conference. Um, you know, Brad Arthur, they asked Brad Arthur straight up, you know, obviously you had to change some tactics on the fly. You know, Gutherson, you know, Clint had to do a fair bit more kicking. Was that in the plans? And Arthur said, look, we just had to, like, Gutherson's a decent kicker and he was another option for us when we needed him. And I think that was when they came out at half time, that was, okay, we need you to step up and, you know, um, take a bit of ownership on this because they are smothering us or they're smothering the first choice kickers. So I'm, yeah, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on that. Uh, but defensively, I 100% agree with like, you. Um, it's, it's okay. Yeah, it's fine. Like, that's, what, that's what we're here for. We're supposed to talk about ideas and bounce them back and forth. And like I always say, you are entitled to your incorrect opinion. I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that. Either that or you're going to say you're entitled to your opinion, even that, know how wrong it is. But I'm right in this instance. You're wrong. Um, oh, it's cute that you think that. But anyway, carry on. <laughs> Smart ass. Uh, but Correct. defensively, I will agree with you uh, that I think that the individual efforts were very much a strong suit. Like with the structures, I think that, like you said, again, it's definitely improved. There's, they're not getting around us. You think about their first try, it took a miracle pass from uh, from Gutho to Sevo to score. Like he had to basketball pass that off a flick because they ran out of space and they didn't know what to do. You know, we all jammed in like you should have to shut that play down and he just managed to get that ball away. That was, you know, in turn, that, that was the only result they could really get off our structures. You know, that fell apart a little bit off the, the break through the middle from the with the Gutherson try. But apart from that, individual efforts were definitely on show. Like you think about one that sticks in my mind really heavily is uh, Gu- um, Bateman's effort from Marker when they were 10, 15 out and he just let, caught him, pulled him down. He could have got away and created, you know, something out of nothing, but he pulled him down. It was those sort of that sort of mentality where no nothing is dead in the water. You can fight and fight and fight until there is nothing left to give. And there were instances like that where you could see it kind of lift the rest of the team. So that was really, really good to see. And I think for me, defensively, um, Probably my biggest surprise packet, and he's been my surprise packet for the whole year, was Caesar. He was aggressive. He was ball and all tackle every single time. I think he may have missed one tackle when he was going around the legs, but every single time he was ball and all tackle. Like I think he, he caught Gutho down in his own 20 at least two or three times by being the first one there, by wrapping that ball up and shutting everything down. So, mm. yeah. yeah, very good. Very impressive. Yeah, I think all in all, look, I, I agree with you. I, I'm not saying that bad. I'm just saying there was one area that I noticed, and maybe it was just primarily in the second half. Uh, but I was saying it I was saying it in my head a lot, it's particularly with Gutherson as well, is attack him. If he's kicking, attack him. And I just wasn't saying it. And they're probably just gassed, mate. Like you, you said, they did a, a mountain of work in that first half. Um, but... Yeah, it's not to say the effort areas weren't there. It certainly was. Like the defensive resilience they showed is un- was just unreal, um, mm. and so untigers like. And they just they swarm, and they they don't stop. And and they're not perfect. They still miss tackles, and they still have ineffective tackles. But they are there are black, white, and orange jerseys there every time this year, um, and yeah. that's a big difference. You notice that when they're going to the edges, 
they're not often going to Olam and, and Tupo's sides. They're not often swinging to our left. Uh, I wonder why that might be. But, uh, yeah, so, yeah, no, mate, it, it was very, very good. All right. What I might do is we might just go down through our list and we'll have a little bit of a chat about each player and what we thought, how we thought they went. Uh, we only have to go through 15 players because we didn't use two of our bench, which is an insane so, rarity. Very phenomenal. That it is, effort. but I think, yeah, I think just given uh, given the way the game was going, how tight it was, you didn't want to upset the apple cart at any point. So I think that's what led to well, that. You understand Sullivan not getting a, a look in because you needed Appy out there, you needed that leadership. But to not have Kapoor get on and replace someone in the in the forward pack just shows. Mm. I don't know what they did in terms of fitness for preseason, but holy shit, they're fit. Special yeah, absolutely. Staff. Jesus Christ. Yeah. It went unreal. Okay. So, Jareem Below. Stock standard. Like, I think this is going to be um, copy-paste every single week. He just keeps mm. getting better. That, mm. like, we, talk, we talked about last week and we talked about the week before. For me, the support play just continues to improve and the ball playing mm. continues to improve. You know, this is – it's scary to think that this this kid is only 22 and he has no ceiling yet. So, he, hadn't de- he hadn't debuted this time last year. Yeah, that's how many games he has under his belt. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, barely anyone, had, barely anyone outside of Tigers had heard of him a year ago. He was still a month from debuting almost. So, yeah, wild. Incredible. He he backed up really well, didn't he? I mean, and that was where it was. There was a couple of other half chances that we didn't end up taking, uh, but he was right there as well. And then, obviously, he was there on the uh, the Galvin break to put us in front. And you mentioned before the show that the turn of pace that he had, it, so long he's sweeping around the back in cover, wow. uh, was already in full stride. Buller was flat-footed and had to get going and then just st- streaked away from him over the course of 25, 30 metres. And Delonghi didn't even get a hand on him. It was it was it was incredible. Like I was watching that, and everyone's talking about the Galvin pass, which was amazing in itself. But Buller had to catch the ball behind him, flat-footed, and then score. But by the time he put the ball down, he was ten meters in front of Delonghi. And that's like you watch. Yeah. If you guys, if our listeners go back and watch the highlights of that try again, watch very specifically how quickly he creates that, I guess, that gap between him and the defender. It's phenomenal. Yeah. And he still looks like he's in second gear while doing it. It's... <laughs> I know. It's so casual. Uh, mate, Chuck Staines, for me, he had his best game um, since last Defend- year. Defended Sevo so well. Yeah, I don't I don't think he's going to be a name, similar with Tupo on the other wing. I don't think they're going to be names that get mentioned in the top three or five because we had so many good players on the day, but yeah, Chuck was one of them. He ran the ball with purpose. He cut Sivo down time after time after time. And I know that Sivo, I think, was struggling with a bit of cramp or a calf issue or something in the end. But but he was doing it all game. And yeah. he just didn't. He did not give him a look in. He ran with purpose, like I said. Yeah. So yeah, much improved. And hopefully, he's building that confidence back after that injury yeah. he had last year. Yeah, mate. Sol Falatape. I like you said. I think he's got some. Work to do still in defence, but uh, he didn't get much of an opportunity, to be honest. Yeah. You know, we didn't have a lot of ball in that first half, um, and he, they were sending a lot of traffic down his way. I still think he held his own. I think that he will continue to improve. And you know, I was discussing with you. I sent it on the chat today. Obviously, people that live don't uh, that live under a rock don't know that. Uh, Zach Lomax will be released from the Dragons next year. And I messaged you guys and said, do we have a look at him? I don't think so. I think we're pretty good. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll talk about Sol and then maybe just we'll we'll touch on the, the Lomax um, thing quickly as we go through yep. now so we don't have to revisit it. Mate, um, yeah, he, he was quiet. I think that what I like about Sol is, from what we've seen so far, is he's a competitor and he's in everything. You know, if there's a contest, he's at, he's in the contest. If there is a ball on the ground, he's there, ready for the scramble. He's there. He's not. He's not passive. He's he does 
kind of he goes after the game a little bit. I think he needs a bit more confidence in getting in closer to the ball to take a few more runs. But outside of that, I think we also think- prefer Jazzy Ollum's side at the moment. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, yeah, defensively, there are still some issues there. We did look shaky a bit on that on that side, and I think Stain's jamming worked quite well. Um, and I think, but, you know, he's, he's learning. He's played, uh, what, two games of first grade? Yeah. Now, yeah, it's his second. It's his second first grade game. I mean, it's very easy to forget that. Is that I right? Think he played the Raiders game? No, I think he played the Raiders game. He, is, he played the Raiders. He did. Sorry, it's his third. Yeah, yeah. So him and sorry, I was thinking about Stafford Tower, and I thought it was Olam, but Olam didn't come till last last oh, week. I yeah, so it's second his, third, there. his third first grade game. Um, so that will improve. But yeah, it was at times a little bit shaky, and it wasn't so much his ability to tackle. I think it was just working in conjunction with his side. Now, I think has he switched sides as well since he came back? Because I think, yeah, he has. Because Stafford was on the right and Sol was on the left. Yeah. So it's only his second game on the right. So, yeah, true. Yeah, look, I mean, you're going to expect that to happen. There was a couple of times where Charlie would jam and Ooh. Sol would hang back, and that created some issues I'm out on that left hand side. On our right hand side. That is but look outside of that. Hand. You can't be too harsh on him. I'm glad he's getting another game again. Uh, Naden had One an absolute sec. belter and almost basically single-handedly won the game for the Magpies in State Cup last week in a come-from-behind victory when he was playing fullback and then sort of got moved into the halves um, and played unreal, apparently. He's 18th man this week, so I think that Naden is now back, and and judging on the weekend, he played quite well. He's actually playing halfback this coming week in the New South Wales Cup, Brent Naden. Uh, So he's he's there knocking on the door, Um, so we'll see what goes Moving forward in that regard, um, a good a good Naden is someone you probably want in your side. The Naden we've gotten so far is eh, no thanks, mm-hmm. costly penalty yeah, no. or a, a suspension or a silly error or something. So, but he certainly is a game breaker when he's on. Juzzy Ola, mate, second game in Tigers no. colours, he scored three tries. Two. He scored, oh, he scored, a, he scored three all up. Scored three all up. Okay. He scored two yeah. yesterday, but yes, uh, mate. I think it's probably one of the best signings we've had in a while. To be honest, I think he. After two games, uh, disclaimer. Disclaimer, yeah. After two games, <laughs> uh, so I think he brings a calmness and a maturity to the side that we haven't had for a while, especially out wide, especially when we've had to. You know, go through the likes of um, hapless wingers that don't want to try or pathetic centers that think they're the best center in the world, things like that. You know, not naming names here, but people can probably put two and two together. Um, so it's such a breath of fresh air. And you mentioned it last week when he scored the try, he grabbed the Tigers emblem. And for you, that meant like, this is me now, this is who I am, and I'm mm. going to make you regret letting me go. Um, he did it again when he scored mm. his second try. Looked directly at the camera. Wrong camera, by the way, unfortunately. Mm. But he looked directly at the camera and did that. So I think he's all in. And he's all in. Yeah. It's it's you know only two seasons ago he was the best center in the game. So you know yeah. we've we've got ourselves a good in there. What I might say, and I I realised I didn't actually comment on the Lomax thing. I'll comment on it in a sec. But um, what I like, you said thus far he's one of the best signings we've made in a while. Like, no doubt, obviously, it's two games, though. But for me, it's the fact that he's turned up and delivered so early. And I would say he's probably – his our return on investment in terms of how quickly we've gotten something out of him has probably been one of the best in recent memory. Even up he took – games for the team to gel and you could see what he was doing, but it was, it wasn't really working. And you, we know how insanely incredible up he's been for our side. So in terms of Aussie, uh, Jazzy showing up and producing immediately, could not have asked, exceeded expectation 10 times over. He's been incredible. Mate. Um, so you mentioned Lomax. Um, I'm not averse to having Lomax come into the side. The problem is one is the price tag. I'd be lucky to pay 600 even for Lomax. Yeah. And secondly, I I don't know enough about Lomax's character because, and I say that because all I've read is just through journalists. 
excuse me, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't watched enough in depth interviews with him. I haven't heard him talk on other podcasts outside of footy. So I don't know enough about him, whether or not he fits into what Benji wants to do. Now, Lomax grew up a rabid, rabid West Tigers supporter. And Benji Marshall was his hero. Yeah. And Benji Marshall was his hero. He's gone on record as saying that. Um, And so it's, it's probably something where we are a possibility and we don't have centers. I mean, as much as we're talking about, you know, a little bit of depth there at the moment, we've gotten Olam in now. Fartape looks a prospect. Naden, when he's on, um, is good. Centers have been an issue for a long time. I just wonder, like, that would definitely fill a gap. Do we get value for money out of it? Are we, are we, are we possibly then overlooking other areas now that are possibly more important? Um, you know, is, is one okay center and a decent center in Olam justifiable and can we spend money elsewhere? It's an interesting proposition. Um, for the right price, I think yes. But in terms of who you'd have to lose or how much you'd have to spend is the big thing for me. And I don't know, man. I, there's not many centres that I'd be willing to break the bank for these days in terms of how our side is balanced and, and where our strengths are coming through. We've got a lot of juniors that we want to hang on to. And so I'm loath to go out and spend big money on somebody who is talented but sporadic. Yeah, fair. And like I said, I personally don't feel like we need him. If we got him for the right price, I wouldn't push him to the curb. But I don't think we need him. And I wouldn't, like you said, wouldn't break the bank for him. I don't think Mm -hmm. he has, you know, when he signed that contract with the Dragons, you had to believe that that was just a sniff of desperation from the Dragons to keep somebody who was a quality player. But was he an eight hundred thousand dollar a year player? No, 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 no. Hmm. You know, Juzzy? Yeah, I could probably think of that at the moment. I'd I'd pay that with how much. Tell you what, I would do. I tell you what, what I would do. Next year, um, is there still talk about Hunt finishing up or like moving on, or has he decided he's going to stay next year now? I think he's definitely staying this year, but. Beyond that, we don't know. Don't know. Um, I, I, I thought I heard something that he'd agree to stay next year too, but at least we'll wait and see. Uh, they've got Kyle Flanagan on the books. I think he's there for a year. Outside of that, they've got Junior Ramone, who's been deregistered and stood down. He may well come back. What other halves have they got? Because we're very, very quickly creating a log jam that we all saw coming, but it's not by round five. Yeah. Um, would you throw them? Bud Sullivan and one of our spare hookers, maybe a Jake Simkin or something like that, um, in exchange for Zach Lomax. Because then for me, if we're paying six hundred for something for him, six fifty, then it's not that much of a tear up considering Bud himself is on five fifty and will be surplus to requirements. I'm gonna say that emphatically now. Like I didn't want to put the mockers on it. He will be surplus to requirements. If he's not already Yeah. And there is, he's never shied away from the fact that he loves the Dragons. He never wanted to leave the Dragons. He just wanted a greater opportunity. Now, they're obviously in dire straits with a half. You know, Carl Flanagan's doing a serviceful job playing for Dad. But, you know, definitely something to really consider. And, you know, it's it's not a bad idea to float, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I'll be getting on the phone pretty soon. And I'd even, yeah, we've spoken about that before, but we'll get to Caesar in a minute. The way Caesar's going, you just give him a year to year. year. Yeah, bloody oath. Yeah, year year to year, then get him him in as a trainer on the coaching staff. And yeah, all right. So let's keep moving on. I mentioned Junior Tupo before, mate. His carries were just unreal. He was just back to his absolute damaging best. Uh, What did he have? Um, 11 runs for 145 metres. (laughs) <laughs> phenomenal that's insane i mean that's like 13 meters a run and tackle breaks uh i've got tackle breaks here so he's got one line break he should have had two but he went down with cramp which was just criminal nine tackle breaks <laughs> he he and steph were just they were just wrecking balls they couldn't even oh. they couldn't get near him yesterday uh incredible <clears throat> so good 
Yeah, I yeah. I said to you uh, against the Raiders, I just wanted to see more. I thought he was quiet. I think I thought that because um, I guess everyone else was kind of lifting when he was just stock standard. Now he's just... It's what you expect from him. You expect these bullocking runs. You expect these meters. So, yeah. Yeah, mate. Incredible. All right. Lucky Galvin. Now, Lock, Lock and Galvin's been hit with a grade three uh, hip drop charge. So, he's going to miss two weeks, unfortunately, and just horrible timing. Before you get to talking about him, what I will say is that there might be a silver lining to that and that he's come in. He's had three big games. He's got all these plaudits. He now gets the chance as an 18-year-old to just sit back a little bit and just take stock and take a breath because it's been a big first month. Um, So, you know, in some ways, and it it gives Latu a chance that we'll talk about later in the show. But um, in a way, maybe it's a good chance for him to now just have a breather um, because these seasons can catch up on young men really, really quickly. And everything everything that we've seen out of Lockie so far tells us that he is probably going to be the exception to the rule in that regard. But... You know, an 18 year old kid is going to have a few bumps and bruises physically and mentally. So maybe a break, whilst not ideal, is not entirely uh, the end of the world. But no, there's definitely a silver lining to it. Mate, um, what impressed you about Lockie in this game? Took the game by the balls, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He really did. He was, you know, a lot of people have said it, so I am not coming up with anything new here, but. Yeah, obviously, when he went off from Sinbin, there was he had every right as an eighteen-year-old to go into his shell, um, to sort of you know not go shit. What have I done? I don't want to let the team down again. Instead of that, his mentality was, I need to make up for that. <laughs> as an eighteen-year-old, yeah. to have that maturity and that thought process to lump responsibility on your back rather than shirk it, it's uh, he is a special, special player. Uh, he's, yeah. you know, we've got to give him more time. You know, he's going to have his ups and downs. We've mentioned this quite a few times. He's going to have his ups and downs. Every player does. There is no one that has just skyrocketed and just yeah. stay on that trajectory. But yeah, nobody. I, I, I just, I just feel that his, uh, his slumps aren't going to be as bad as we think they are. So let's hope not, um, mate. He. His touch is incredible. It's so silky and mm. it's so deft. And I know that's a word that gets used in sentences all the time. It's just, it's really subtle. And, you know, you said he takes the game on. That's what I, you said takes the game by the balls. I was going to say the same thing. He takes the game on. If he sees something, he goes after it like he's playing schoolboy footy still, which <laughs> what a <It's> mentality <laughs> to have. And the proof is in the pudding. And when I talk about him having this delicate touch, there's two instances and it's the two try assists that he played a role in that kick he was so deep in the line and to to be running at that pace towards the try line you almost have to pull your foot back to reduce the weight on that kick because it just dribbled in and I know that he sort of hit high shin the foot's there but the control there I'm not gonna worry about the bounce the bounce was a fluke but just to, to understand, even just playing kick touch or something, whoever's listening out there, if you're out there throwing a footy around, try running the ball and then dropping a dropping a grubber three or four metres in front of you and getting it to sort of pull up around there. Just incredible. And I mentioned to you before the show in his other one, uh, so the one where he put us in front, the, the one that's going to be on the highlight reels for most of his career, where he's drifted to the outside of Talangi, He's thrown the dummy, sold Penasini down the river, put the big stiff arm into Lungi's face. Um, that that arm, mate, but mind you, is probably going to be about that round, but it works. Um, <laughs> runs downfield. Now, if I want to talk about that deft touch and the subtlety in the, in the way he manipulates the ball, I mentioned to you earlier, as he's coming to Gutho's contact, he knew he was going to get tackled. He didn't try to beat him. Most people in that situation would wrap the ball, lean low, bring their centre of gravity down and drive into the play to try to get some sort of momentum over the top of them or bump them back. He didn't. He saw where Gutherson's shoulders were whereabouts. They were out sort of sternum height, mid-low sternum. You see him raise his arms up above the contact, which means that Gutherson's arms come through, which means he's guaranteed to be above him as he falls. He then shifts his ball to two hands, pops it gently out to the side for Buller to go accelerate to the try line. It was incredible. 
incredible. That is such an unnatural um, thing to do when going into contact. Either you're trying to avoid contact by running at arms or between players, or you brace. I know as a player, I always braced. It just it's just what my body did when I was going into contact. I'd lean in and drive. Mike, to lift, to know that he's making his hands available because he knows he's got the support player there. He knew approaching Gutherson, I reckon, that it was a try. And yeah, mate. Um, but not just yeah, that. Like you got to add incredible. an extra factor to that. In he got it underneath Penasini's hands. In a mm. the corridor would have been about half a foot to get that perfectly to Buller. Now he didn't get it perfectly because, as we mentioned, Buller had to stop flat-footed and then um, you know sprint to the try line. But to even get that through that narrow gap at that speed after already doing that, yeah. that is a clear sign of a very, very, very intelligent footballer. And yeah, by that, I don't is. mean... That's that, what he is. I, and by that, I don't yeah. mean like he could fucking do the times tables while he's bloody that. What I mean by that is he sees things... It's as if he sees things two steps before everyone else. He can, like you said, he probably saw what Garthu was doing. He probably knew it was going to be a try because he knew exactly what he could do. And... He mentioned it in uh, after the game. He's like, you know, yeah, Jareem was always there. He's just screaming on the inside, oh, pass, pass, pass. He's always there anyway. He mm. knew exactly what was going to happen two seconds before anyone else. Yeah. Now, there's very few players that have had that sort of mentality. But when they do, when they come to light, you can see it. And it's mm. it's incredible to watch. Mate, but, he's making he's making se- he's manipulating seasoned footballers. Like for me, in that contact, he manipulated Gutherson in that contact. A bloke that's played State of Origin and is a, is a gun, decent, like a really good fullback. He, mm. man- he manipulated him. He knew exactly what he was doing, like he was playing against school kids, which he was six months ago. Yeah, um, where we I mean, we could talk about how impressive the young fella is all night, but he is. He's Tell impressive. me something. Tell me something, though. Is there a deficiency in his game at the moment that you see? Doesn't know how to not hip drop. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, I think there's always going to be areas for him to improve. And I, it, from every report, he goes looking for those areas. Doesn't rest on his laurels. Doesn't sit there and think, oh, you know what? I've already done this. Who cares? Right. He wants to improve day in and day out. Right now, I think for me, you know, I think in attack, he's got that maturity. He's got that foresight in terms of what can occur. I think probably his pass selection is one thing that could probably improve a little bit on. You know, he definitely looks to, you know, and it's what you sometimes want is the safest option. But, you know, when you think about sweet plays and things like that, the great players always know where they where the defense is going to rest or where the defense is going to uh, jam and where to go and where, where not to go. I just think that's probably an area he could improve in. We don't do a lot of sweet plays at the moment to really see that, but there has been times when he's gone short, when he could have gone long and gained an extra few yardages or something like that, you know. But the way this kid's developing, I don't think that's going to be a deficiency for long. And when I say deficiency, that's me really looking hard. Yeah. Geez, we're nitpicking and we don't need to be doing it. Um, but I guess when I asked the question, I didn't really frame it correctly. Maybe what I was thinking in my mind was if you're Lockie Galvin's coach, what are you saying to him at the moment? What areas are you saying to improve? That's what coaches do. They, they facilitate improvement in their players. Um, for me, because it's really hard because we're all we're all glowing and so impressed by what he's done since he's burst on the scene. Um, for me, all I would be saying to him is keep doing exactly what you're doing, but just start talking more and more and more and more. I want yep. you out there barking whatever the fuck you want at these blokes because they're your players out there. And and really, as soon as as soon as I can, just continuing to empower him. Not that he looks like he needs it, but continuing to empower him to manipulate, again, his own players this time as to where he wants them. Because this bloke looks like a chess master out there to me. He looks like he's moving chess pieces around the board. And I, he's and like I said a pot or two ago, in some ways it's the worst we're ever going to see him because he's only going to get smarter, stronger, and faster. 
That's scary. Exactly. And he, he look he looks to me like he's a manipulator. So yeah. Anyway, it's not the Lachlan Galvin podcast. We've got two weeks to cool our cool our jets, although hopefully we're talking about Latu in the same vein next yeah. week. We'll have to we'll have to see how that plays out, mate. Aiden Caesar. <laughs> he, yeah, Aiden Caesar, mate, um obviously kicked the the uh the winning field goal in the end there towards the end. Um what did you like about Aiden's game? I think I said it before, he's just determination. You know, he's just, he's had a couple, he had a, like, in, from his own omission, he had a couple of poor kicks, but majority of yep. it was quite solid, um, knew where he needed it to be. But that's, for everything you see of a quality half, that's stock standard. That should be stock standard. It shouldn't mm-hmm. be, oh, you know, I'm so glad he did that. It should be, well, it's good to see he did that again. For mm-hmm. me, it was, he doesn't, doesn't shirk away from the or doesn't shy away from the the nitty gritty stuff. Getting into the into the trenches and the tackling, the defending, getting in the face, you know, screaming at the ref, which I enjoyed. You know, I was talking to the ref, going, "But sir, they're doing a task." Rah rah rah. I enjoyed that, and I just yeah. I love that determination. And that's that's something that, like you said, if he doesn't get an offer from another club, we need to re-sign him for at least a year. Because that sort of mentality needs to be taught to the next generation. You know who need him? The Bulldogs. Oh shit, yeah. The Bulldog and he's a Bulldogs junior. The Bulldogs need someone like Aiden Caesar. But yeah, he's he has come back and he's just led in terms of energy and, and tenacity and line speed and vigor and everything. It's incredible. It's some of our oldest guys are running the show in that regard in Appy and, and Caesar, but and Bateman, I guess, for that matter. But the senior blokes in the side are, are really not only aiming up, but they're leading from the front, which is exactly what you expect mentors to do. And they're not going to be able to do it all season, I don't think. They're going to have uh, dips and whatnot. They're not going to be able to do it forever. So, But you need to be able to establish those ground rules, which allows then those younger players to see what the blokes around them are doing, the more experienced blokes, and go, I'm going to go with them. And yeah. then once you empower the likes of your polays and – you Sam Wellers, then the sky's the limit then. No, mate, yeah. he was incredible. Stefano Ekokamanu, he had another barnstorming game. 119 metres, five tackle breaks, ran over the top of, I think, everybody twice. Um, mate, he, he's having quite the year, and I think at the start of the year, that's what I was saying, what I was thinking. I just felt it. I think you were the same. Um, I could just see him really stepping up this year and every stint so far, every game he's played, He's going from strength to strength. He's finally starting to show us what he's always promised. Yeah, no, very, very hard to disagree with any of that. So much so that if he, obviously, you know, he needs to continue this form all the way up to it, but if he is not picked in state of origin, doesn't reclaim that Blues jersey, based on that form, it is personal with match. It is 100% personal with match. So because oh, mate, no, he'll be there. He, he's I mean, kicking down that door and fucking setting it on fire. That is what he's doing right mate, now. Injuries aside, Api Corusau is the is the hooker for New South Wales. Madge signed him to the Tigers before Madge got the sack. And yep. then um he also played him in the grand final over uh Cameron McInnes in twenty fourteen. Yep. Madge loves him. And he's playing Corusau is probably playing career best form. And for a bloke who's got several rings uh, and has played in some good sides and been a weapon for a long time, that's that's quite an achievement. Uh, yeah. On the weekend, I, I look, geez, I don't want to be – I'm not going to be critical, but all I'm going to say is that he probably just didn't stand out as much as what he did in other games because other players, which is what you want in a successful football side, other players just stood out a little bit more. Um, he obviously missed that unfortunate that. tackle on – I'll talk about that. What's that? Yeah. I didn't. I yeah, was like, sorry. I'm talking about Appy or Steph now. Yeah, sorry, I got a bit confused there. Appy. Cool. Maybe I think because I was reading his name. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, you were talking about Madge earlier. I think I got I got a bit yeah, sidetracked, but Steph was great. All right. Um, <laughs> so Appy. Uh, yeah, I think Appy had a great game, but he he didn't have the game he had the week before, but where he put us on his back and and led us to the win. He just played his part and he played it as we expect him to play it extremely well. Um, he had that unfortunate miss. 
uh, on Hopgood, which led to the forward pass that Gutherson <laughs> scored off. For some reason, they didn't decide to play it, even though he caught it six metres after it was thrown. Um, other than that, though, yeah, he just he just did what Appy does. And I actually like the fact that he didn't have to stand out this game. That meant that we, we were able to come back and get the chocolates without having to rely on Appy, which is good news. Yep. No, 100% agree. And I love hey, Clem it. Ran for, Clem, uh, ran, sorry, did you have any more on I Appy? Don't, I don't need to add any more to that. I think every listener probably agrees with you and is excited by the fact that he didn't have to stand out. Yeah. Because so. we can't, bottom line is we can't be doing that to him every single week. I mean, he had his nope. gastro last week and he and he put us on his back and then this week he played 80, obviously with Bud not getting on. <laughs> Excuse me. And then we've got a five-a-day, sorry, I set you off. We've got a five-day turnaround into the Dolphin this coming week. So, yeah. Mate, Dave Clemmer ran for 151 metres. Um, if you if you didn't notice that happening, so no, dude, for me, so funny. for me, Clem this year is is fallen right into the background, and he is the bloke that just does his job, which he did do last week, last year, but it stood out a bit more. But he's just doing his job behind the scenes, locking up the middle. Tackle efficiency is still phenomenal, and uh, yeah, he's just he's become just a consummate professional in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, and like that's you think about other teams, like I, was, I think I mentioned this um, last week. You think about your James Fisher Harris's, your Payne Haas's, your Steph's. These are those bullocking, you know, impressive forwards that do just have this presence about them. But the quality teams that have a, you know, a nice, good, solid front row uh, pairing, the other one is just the workhorse. He just does the little things and he does them well. That's what Clemmer is. And that's what you need. Like like you said, tightens up the middle. Tackles efficiency, I think, was at 97% again. You know, ran for 151 this week, this week, it was at 89%. He missed one and had one ineffective. Why would you ruin my tangent with the truth? Well, being correct sometimes matters, mate. Yeah, but, but it right. now ruined my story. Um, this is another twelve. This is another twelve situation, though, where we're saying eighty nine percent. Ah, Clem, yeah. what a shocker, <laughs> mate! But yeah, he has. And am I reading this wrong? No, no, never mind. How many men's did he play? Uh, he played. He played forty seven. Forty seven minutes. So he played yeah. less than Steph. And he yeah. ran for 40 metres more. But we're talking yeah. about how good Steph played. Yeah. Look at that. So. Yeah. So. Just... Yeah. 13, 13 runs for 151 metres. So he made good post-contact metres as well. 66. Yeah. Um, there you go. And, and and that's that's the thing as well is that stats don't always tell the story. And watching it live doesn't always tell the story. And they work counter to each other. So, you know, everybody's waxing lyrical about Steph's performance. And rightly so. It was a barnstorming, impactful performance. He was skittling defenders, which has obviously more impact than simply what it says in the numbers. But then you look at the numbers, which also matter. And I was watching Clem. Uh, there's a bit of criticism around Clemmer being, Clemmer being a former Aaron Woods type in that numbers-only type prop, as in numbers-only matter, and that he always gets put on his back. He gets put on his back sometimes, but it doesn't slow his play the ball speed. No, I was and the other thing I noticed that. as well is that I was I was particularly watching it the other day. He actually wasn't getting put on his back against Parramatta as much as what he may have done in games prior. So, uh, no, going quite quite well. Like I'm I, I am, and you can feel free to break it up if you wish. I'm going to bundle Papali'i and Bateman in together, and I'm going to say similar to Clemmer. I don't think they stood out, but those two this year are doing all the little stuff right. They're tightening up our edges. They're playing at a million miles an hour. They're we don't have any. Sh- they're not being showstoppers. We're not requiring on our on our edge back rowers to break the game open for us. But they're doing all the little things that we thought they were going to bring last year. But they're doing it this year. They both ran for over 120 meters. Obviously, um, both played 80 minutes. I think from memory, with um, Kapoa yep. not getting on the field. Yep, and. Again, they, they have a little mistake here or there, a little drop ball or a little penalty or something like that. But the, talking about tenacious, particularly Johnny, 
um, yeah, those two blokes on the edges are uh, putting everything into these performances. I yeah, I don't think anything else needs to be said. I am so happy. Like I thought that John Bateman was always going to bring this, but after last year's performance, I thought Ice was just he was going to leave us, and you know it was going to be another Adam Blair situation. Complete opposite. He has mm. made me eat my words. So, and I'm very happy to eat them. Tastes like chocolate. Yeah. So, and I, I actually like the fact that it's different. Like they bring stuff that is different. Those guys aren't the prototypical second rowers in some ways, particularly Bateman. And I mm. like that he is a point of difference. Um, it's it's not like you can have a standard playbook when you come up against the Tigers edge back rowers. It's not a copy and paste. It's not a um, Tupanua or a Olakawatu or a Kaloa Matangi, who are all, for the most part, big, rangy, strong, edge-back rowers that play a power game with an offload. You can approach them in similar ways. These guys are different. They offer different stuff, and, and they're not carbon copies of each other on the other side. They're completely yeah. different from each other too. So I do like that there's variety in, in that area of our, our forward pack. Uh, and being a bit on the lighter side, as Johnny is, uh, I don't think affects us because our middles are doing such a good job holding their own at the moment. So speaking of middles, for New Apollo, uh, for me, he is the lock now. Yeah. Um, it, it buys us 12 to 18 months to find maybe a more creative option. But for the moment, for the balance of our side, for the game that we want to play, I'm all for it. And he's doing a tremendous job in the middle. Yeah. Again, I think uh, I not more needs to be said. He was... He had a, I think he had a, a poor, I think he dropped the ball uh, when we were trying to fight back into the game and put us under pressure again. I got a little bit critical of him in that, but then you also think about how much defending he did in the middle. It, you know, you can forgive him for that. So, yeah, I think like the 1-13, to, one to 13, it's his to lose. He is our lock. Uh, if he keeps playing this way, um, nobody's taking that position from him. Mate, Kapoa and Bud, Bud Sullivan obviously didn't get on the field. A, a weird one doesn't happen very often that two players don't get on the field. It's rare for one to not get on the field, but that's the yep. way it played out. Uh, Safe Uh Never kick again is my first point. <laughs> Forgot about but, that for a moment. Yeah, but again, it looked like it's a very simple game plan for him. And if you keep it yeah. simple, he does his job, and that's what we want. Yeah, I agree, mate. He made 26 tackles, missed none. Yep. So, Go out there, um, try to get try to get over the advantage line, play on your runs, play on the front foot, hit the AB defender, uh, try to get a quick play of the ball and then make all your tackles, lead us with a bit of line speed. I think that's his simple message. And yep. at the moment, he's executing on it. And as long as he's executing on it and, and doing that stuff right, there's no errors in his game. There's no penalties in his game. Um, he deserves a spot on the bench. Absolutely. He's doing a good job in that role. But I think that's his spot. I don't... I think he's very much like uh, Spencer Lenu in that he is better served off the bench. Uh, right. Obviously, Spencer could prove us wrong at the Roosters right now, but um, he's better served off the bench. I think that potentially... like I think I mentioned this last week, uh, you know, with the golden retriever sort of comparison... He just needs to use that nervous energy or need, needs to use that excitement when everyone else is kind of exhausted, flailing, whatever they're doing. So, I mean, credit to him. He, he's improving on areas that he needed to improve on, and that shows, yep. in my eyes, a smart footballer. We've seen a myriad of footballers, talented footballers in the past that don't improve in those in key areas. You can name, you name a million of them. The only yeah. other player that got game time, mate, was Sam Fainu. Huh. What was your take on Sam's game? 28 he, tackles Yeah, at 93%. Up. Like, if if we talk about your first picks um, in the team, he's he's there. He's one of the first picks. He may not be a starter, but he, he adds this controlled aggression. We mentioned it last week. He's reigned in a lot of that silliness that only took him a week to kind of understand what he needed to do. You know, that hit he put mm. on Morgan Harper, everyone was like, oh, he's yeah. you know, really getting in his face, really. They're ex-teammates. They're good mates. Yeah. He probably just yeah. said, sucked in, Morgan, I got you. That's all he was yeah, saying. I'm loving it. 
Yeah. That's what that was. That hit was exactly what footy was about. Clean hit, both of them laughing at, laughing. Yeah. Harper taking his medicine. That was good. Yeah, and yeah, I think, I I think that the the sort of trade with Safarth and uh, Samuela off the bench is kind of the perfect situation right now. You've got that controlled aggression who really leads from the front, but then you've also got that enthusiasm and excitement that Safarth brings and can lift a team through that as well. Yeah, energy. They energy. both bring a bit of energy. They're both they're both not see, they're not impact style props like a Lenu, as in they don't just bring off the back fence running, but they bring a more well rounded energy and intensity to the game. So they yeah. might not Sam, Sam's a strong runner in particular, but they he might still run and knock a few knock a few pins over. But it's the stuff they bring holistically, I think. Um all the little effort areas, the kick chase all of a sudden increases, the pressure from marker increases. Uh, and they they like getting on the front foot as well, playing flat off Appy. So, yeah, it is, it is, mate. It's a good combination, and it's a good way to – it's a good different way that I've never really thought about to view uh, your bench and, and how your bench can bring intensity because when we think intensity, when we think impact, we think Spencer Lenu. We think yeah. Gavay and Tapio in 2014 for us. Yeah, that's what we think of. But none of those blokes I just mentioned were the one percent of types. So yeah, I like it. That's I think that's a good perspective. All right. Anything yeah. else you want to mention about the any, <laughs> anything else you want to mention about the game on the weekend? Um, uh, Lachlan Galvin's hip drop tackle with the two weeks. Um, yeah. Look, any ar- any standard. arguments there? No, they set a standard. Um, yeah. If as long Hard as they argue that. yeah, as long as they consistently live up to this standard. If, if we see, you know, the same thing happened with, um, I think his name was Plath from, um, yep. Max Plath from the Dolphins. Same thing happened to him. I think he got three weeks. John something Plath's like son. Who's? He got two as well. Do you know John oh, yeah. Plath played for the Broncos? Nah. Okay. N- nah. I, who cares about the Broncos? Shit. Um, I'm just, just student of the game over here, mate. It's all right. You casual observer yeah, over there. No the game too. I just don't give a shit about the Broncos. Um, Casual observer, no worries. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they've set the standard, and as long yep. as they're consistent, I'm. I'll we'll take our medicine and we'll move on. Uh, if I see a very similar situation with a more highly ranked team and nothing happens, I'll be up in arms. But if they keep this, if they keep it consistent, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, it's just unfortunate. Yeah. Yep. Just unfortunate. You can tell. You can tell oh, as soon as as soon as uh it happened, as soon as gameplay sort of hit himself in the head and just went, shouldn't have done that. Yeah, no, you shouldn't have. Mate. Yeah, but he, he knew. Yeah, yeah. All right. We mentioned the silver lining early in the show, didn't we? We did. Yeah. So yeah, so having that little rest break, hopefully, uh, will do him the world of good. He comes back fit and firing. He's already fit and firing. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. So into this week, six thirty. 5 p.m. at Suncorp mm-hmm. Stadium. The Tigers, on a five-day turnaround, thank you for that, travel all the way up interstate into Brisbane, and they play the Dolphins. So here's how we line up. Jerem Buller at fullback, Staines and Tupo on the wings, Fatape and Olam are the centres. Bud Sullivan comes in there for the suspended Lockie Galvin at six. Caesar is the seven. The forward pack remains the same. Steph and Clemmer are the props. Appy Coruscant is the hooker. Papa Lee and Bateman on the edges. And Fenua Polo locks the scrum. Then we have the debutant, someone I'm extremely excited about. I've been talking about nonstop for the last six or 12 months, Latu Faunu. He comes into the 14. Uh, whether he plays hooker, whether he plays 5'8", we're not sure yet. We'll have to wait and see. Twal returns from concussion protocol, so he relieves Kapoa, who drops out of the 17. And then we have Safarth and Faunu, Sam. Uh, rounding out the 17. Our extended reserve lists are Aiden, Kapoa, Matamua, Alamalo, and Jake Simpkin. Uh, the big one, mate, obviously there, or the big two, sorry, is Bud coming into the six once more and yep. Latu coming onto the bench. He now, never came into the six. He was a halfback. Just so you're aware. What's that? He never came in at the six. He was the halfback. So this is his first stint at 5'8 for us. Yeah, other than the trials. In the – was it the Dragons trial, I think? Um, I think that they played seven and six as they are now from memory. Um, but we'll have to – anyway, 
yeah. Yeah. You're right. Okay. You are right in terms of the first game. But yeah, so what do you how do you think it's gonna play out in terms of having Bud in there? Um I guess I guess there's a few questions I could throw at you in that regard, but what do you think of him playing in the five eighth role there? Well, I've said this to you. I've said it to listeners, to you, anyone that wants to listen to me. I don't think it's a halfback. I think he's a 5'8". I, he's not a game manager. Uh, he doesn't have the kicking game that we need. So I think he will play better than he has, uh, well, than he did at halfback. He only played one game, obviously, or not even a full game. But, you know, he. Uh, I think he will definitely sort of settle into that 5'8 role a lot better than he will a halfback role. Will I think that he'll have the same impact that Galvin has had in his first two games? No, but mainly because they're two different players, like as in style of players. I think that mm. Galvin's very much eyes up, see what he sees, plays that. I think Sullivan's probably more of he prefers the structure. He prefers the stock standard plays, so... Yeah, it's funny, I wonder. Like, I spoke about earlier in the year when he was playing halfback, like you mentioned earlier, how it looked like he was playing safe. It looked like he was trying to play, to try to be something, mm. in particular, trying to be a half, or a halfback, sorry. Uh, if he gets the same message you get out of Benji, which is basically just go out there, run the ball and play what you see, then it sort of it has the potential to open him up a little bit. Now, I am a little bit concerned about his defence. What I will say, though, is that Especially his defence... Pretty- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> his defense, but particularly his particularly his defense um, off a tap, yeah, his defense statistics. Okay. And if you actually watch earlier in the season, in the trials, and in the first round or two, when you have a look at his contact and his ability to make the tackle, and how broken that edge was that he was playing on, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't him. It was the players outside of him it's that tough. were woeful. It was Stafford Tower and Charlie Stange and, and their connection or lack thereof. It was it was really bad. And they had Papali'i playing on that side too. And there, Papali'i, we've spoken about, has had defensive issues. Even recently, he's been going good, but he does have he's prone to a miss and he's prone to being slow shifting out on a swing because he, he overcommits inside. We've spoken about that. I, I am concerned, but I just I don't think his defense is actually as bad as what it has seemed. I actually think it's the edges that have caused that for Sullivan. But yeah, for me, um, I don't know. It, it's an interesting one because he could come out and brain them, particularly playing in that five eighth role, like you mentioned. Uh, if we look at the weekend, Lockie Galvin had two beautiful try assists. That second one was just it was glorious. If I look at Sullivan and say. Is Sullivan capable of two try assists? Yeah, I believe so. Mm. Uh, I believe he could throw a, a ball or, or kick or whatever. He's a classy player. Um, I guess that I, I, I think confidence is down from the supporters because we haven't seen anything yet. Maybe that's who he is and maybe that's that's all we're going to get, but the possibility is there. Let's get to Latu. So, mate, um, what are your thoughts on how Latu himself might be used? Uh, what are your thoughts on him? You haven't seen much of him yet? Uh, I've seen him play in New South Wales Cup and the highlights um, when he was a Manly or, you know, what was it? Uh, what was, what was the, what's the yeah, yeah, I know it was Manly, but what's the feeder club for Manly, New South Wales Cup? Blacktown. Blacktown, Blacktown. Workers. That's it, Blacktown Workers. Um, I've seen those highlights and I watched the New South Wales Cup game on the weekend. He's, yeah, I'm, if he's used in anything other than the halves, I'll be probably disappointed because he can create something out of nothing. And I think that, I, I think it's probably going to be a bit of an audition between Sal, uh, Sullivan and Fainu for the next two weeks. That's my honest opinion. I think that, mm. you know, there was talks, or I was listening to the commentators uh, of the New South Wales Cup game, and there was straight away, they're like, he's only going to be used for 60 minutes this week or something like that. You know, get back after the few hamstring. But if you have somebody who is, you know, deemed to probably pay, play their whole season in New South Wales Cup, you don't really play them for 60 minutes. You try to get them more match fit. You try to get them to co like, 
that cohesion with the team. And so, again, I could be reading into things. I could be making shit up out of the top of my head. But I feel that there was purpose behind that. And I think that there's going to be a shootout over the next two weeks. Obviously, you didn't know what was going to happen to Galvin or anything like that. But I think the next two weeks are going to be a shootout to who's going to take that 14 when Galvin comes back. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to argue. And if it's a big if, but if Latu outplays Bud, for example, on the weekend and Bud is underwhelming, expect to see him switch the following week is my is yeah. my prediction. Um, because for those that don't know much about Latu Fayunu, you probably didn't know much about Sam Weller earlier um, in the year either, but you now know a little bit about Sam Weller, who's now 20 years of age. Uh, tell me you haven't been impressed with what he's brought to the table. When the two brothers were signed, Sam was barely mentioned. Latu is, is that much of a talent as a 5'8". Latu was the guy up until Galvin over the summer has sort of put his foot forward, and then Latu had the odd hamstring issue or two. Heading towards the trials, it, Galvin and Latu were going to duke it out to see uh, who would be the next cab off the rank. And then Latu had a tweak with his hamstring and that, and he's he's been Benched. handicapped from that. So, uh, and he had he had a suspension there too, yeah, as well. So, um, yeah, don't don't think as though this bloke is sort of the understudy to a Galvin or whatnot. This guy is is a talent, and he is he is up there. He's up there with what Galvin has done and can do. And in some in some circles and in some context, he's better. He's definitely more physically mature. I think he's probably more skillful than Galvin. I think he's got more tricks in his bag. He's a powerful runner. He's a powerful hitter in defense. Um, I think that he is probably a little bit more of a safer player. Galvin plays a lot of eyes up footy. Latu plays a little less eyes up footy. Uh, but... Yeah, folks, he, he's a really, really exciting prospect as well, uh, such is the couple of the articles starting to come out from the, the media outlets trying to find a reason to bash us. Now we've got a logjam in the halves, apparently. I call it embarrassment of riches. But anyway, he gets to make his debut on the weekend. What an exciting time. He gets to do it alongside his brother as well, which is fantastic. Uh, and we've got both Latu and Sam Weller for the next four years. So, um, you know, things do change, but... Um, they're, they're here for the long haul as well. So slow development is is an important thing. It's interesting when you look at something like Galvin and, and Latu and, and you talking about how obviously we've got Jerome coming next year. We've spoken several times before about how you can fit them into future squads. That That's a future problem as far as I'm concerned. It might be a future back end of the year problem this year, but at least we can worry about that sort of stuff next year. The interesting thing to think about is how you manage them this year. So if Galvin then holds that 5'8 position, and do you play Latu in the 14 or do you play him running the side in New South Wales Cup to get full games in? It, it's an interesting proposition. Do you rotate him and Galvin into first over the course of the year? It's, it's going to be interesting, and, and we'll, we'll have to wait and see how Latu finds his feet in, in the grade. But from everything we've seen and what he's done in New South Wales Cup, because he's, he's played New South Wales Cup, uh, whereas Galvin hadn't. Um, yeah, very, very exciting prospect as well. And remember, folks, he's 18, 19 himself. This this is not a 24-year-old. He's another kid who a year I – don't, I don't think he was in school last year or he might have been in school last year too. But, yeah, he's a teenager as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that you brought up the uh, – it's like the media trying to bash us again or trying to find, you know, shit for us to whinge about. You know, it just gets to the point where they rehash stories that happened in the back end of last year. Some social media pundits like to do that and don't do any fucking research. So you're, yeah. everyone knows how I feel about the media, so we won't go down that path again. Well, it's just the case, though. Like, they, they're not allowing this side to experience any positivity. We've come off two wooden spoons, and then what do we get? On the eve of, uh, was it the Canberra game? Richie's writing the article about Benji being a part-time coach. Yeah. Oh, I was just wondering if it could work. No, you weren't, you smart ass. You were deliberately out there trying to have a little dig to unsettle the camp prior. You didn't need to write that. You didn't need to write it. Or write it after the game. Then what did we have? We had the Leichhardt um, stuff come in last week. Uh, and then um, there was something else as well that happened. We then get this win against Para, which was a, a massive win. We're, we're two on the trot. We're two and one. Can't allow this side to have a little bit of joy. Let's... let's uh, talk about and release a couple of articles about, oh, apparently in the off-season, Galvin almost asked for a release. Go away. Yeah. 
go like just for a moment, just can you allow a fan base some positivity? Because there there is there is reasons for yeah, you might have a story. But that's not a story. If it was a story, I, that's like you said, it's two months old. Why release it now? You're releasing it now because the positive press is something that doesn't sell as many papers for whatever reason. And so you've got to put a negative spin on a positive moment. Fuck off. Yeah. Leave us alone for a little bit. It, you know, over the years, the West Tigers have deserved the vast, vast, vast majority of the headlines coming their way because they've been god-awful, run by god-awful administration, making shit decisions across the yin-yang. We're experiencing at the moment a rare, nice moment for our club. As we slowly start to rebuild, we're seeing green shoots. We've got these young guys coming in, doing a wonderful job. We're winning games against the odds. Why are these articles coming out sequentially week on week, shitting on us still? And why is nobody, uh, you know, having a crack about it? It's just, you know, it's it's very easy to not type in their web address and go to their paper. It's very easy to not watch 360. It's very easy to ignore all that sort of stuff. And and we do. Like it, do, it doesn't, as much as I, you know, as much as I've got a slightly strained and frustrated tone in my voice, it doesn't make me lose sleep at night. But it would be nice to see the media in some factions get behind this side who is finally experiencing a bit of joy, even if it's for the sake of the fan base. Like, the, the, I think the thing that you are mentioning last week with the Leica one was the whole blow up about fucking Blocker Roach and Benny Elias not being invited to the, any games. Yeah. Or like, that. like, who that, gives a shit? Yeah, exactly. Who cares? You know, they were le- they're legends of the club. Cool. Like, who gives a shit? That's not news. But the one yeah. that's irked me, and I, I don't know if you watched the press conference um, after the Parramatta game, but, you know, yeah. our, our favourite mate, fucking Brent Reid, the douche. Um, I'm sorry, I'll go on a tangent. I'll probably call him names, but that's just what I do because I can't stand the media. Kept trying to pick this one story. Oh, but you're going up against your brother. Oh, but you're going up against Wayne Bennett, your mentor. How's that going to go? And straight away, he's like, who cares? Let's focus on this game. I was like, I love you, Benji. I love you. Mm. You're so good. He's not having it. No. Yeah. He, just, like, he literally it, it, said, who cares? Mm. And then Brent Reid didn't say a single thing after that. And I think the press conference went for another five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, he put him in his place. And, and, love- and he knows him. He worked with him on Fox Sports. He called him Reedy. Like They know each other. He's like, mate, I'm not playing the game. Yeah. He just shut it down. And he, and he kept, he, as he said, he kept, he kept asking. I think one of the questions he asked was, "Oh, mate, would the the Tigers have last year won that?" And I think that's when he responded, it's "Like, who cares? It's a different side, different coaching team, half the sides completely different. Who cares?" Yeah, yeah, uh, that was really good. It's good to see that same, that, yeah, same mate of yours, Brent Reed. I swear that bloke is just a contrarian. Like, any time there is a point of view, he just says the complete opposite. Today, I was watching three sixty, uh, as I still like to do. Because I like to know what opinions not to have, uh, and they were talking about kickoffs, and he was arguing that oh, we don't really need kickoffs in the game, you know, maybe oh, we should yeah. just go to like maybe we should go to tap offs. And the blokes sitting on the panel were just sitting there going, "Mate, are you all right?" Like fair dinkum. And then he he put his article up about saying they should demolish Acor Stadium. Last week he was ragging saying they should blow up Leichhardt. So he wants us to blow up the suburban ground and move to Acor which is the, the big stadium, now he wants to blow up Acor. What do you want, mate? Like, just do you need any more evidence that he's not him, but just that establishment? I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a joke. It's a disgrace. Anyway, I digress. We were waffled on about that too much. Mate, all right. Dolphins, how do you beat them? Uh, I mentioned this in the chat. Um, watching them against the Titans... It's so good to see how shit the Titans are, by the way. Worst franchise in NRL. Um, <laughs> but uh, you control their middle and you limit their offloads. That was the only way they really they really got uh, any momentum was their offloads. You know, mm-hmm. offloads to to uh, JMK and he's through the middle or he passes out wide and they didn't cover well. Their structure was down. It was, um, what, Desi's lost his last eight games in a row. Great coach. Yeah, well done. Uh, but, yeah, that's how you beat them. You know, I think you mentioned that, you know, they're probably going to be kicking to their tall wingers, but they don't get that option if they 
if we control the middle and we control the rock and yeah. we limit the offloads. And you, and you yeah, I agree. Well, you got your, you got your Bromwich brothers in there. You got um, Felice Cafusi, and you've got uh, who's the other one that caught my eye? Uh, Josh Kerr. They're all offload monsters, particularly Kerr. I mentioned it to you. Kerr had I played really well on the weekend and, and threw a thousand offloads. He was causing havoc with that second phase play, and that's a problem when you have got the likes of Asako and obviously um, your Nicaremas and your your uh, Hammers backing up those types of things in broken field. So definitely need to wrap up the offloads. We did a fair job, I think, against Para, who were notorious for it on the weekend. But for me, it's a similar situation. Their halves are underwhelming, and I'm touching a, a wooden table, obviously. But um, Isaiah Katoa is going to be a decent player, but I don't see him being a revelation at the moment. He's solid and he's consistent, but Cody Nicarima is someone you can rush. Cody, Cody Nicarima is a very frantic player and he can make mistakes. Um, so I'd be putting a lot of kick pressure on them because yeah. that is going to reduce the aerial threat of the likes of Bostock, who's a monster in terms of height. Yeah. Um, and if he can't put it, drop it on a dime, which is very near on impossible to do if you're under pressure, then um, that takes that out as well. So wrap up the ball, pressure the kickers. Uh, and it's going to hold us in good stead, I think. Yeah, very, very similar to what we did with Kynes. So just need yeah. to copy-paste. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Um, how do you see the game going, mate? What's the scoreline? Um, I don't know. I think that the Dolphins came out or came back against the Titans quite well. I think they will have a lot of confidence off that win. And I think they're on top of the table now as well. So, you know, I think they're the only yeah, team. Yeah, they're in without, first position. Yeah, they're the only team without a loss this year, I think. I think they had a buy and then three wins. No, they got pumped by the Dragons. Oh, did they? So they're three and one. Okay. They should be They should be three and one. Hang on, let me have a look. Because North Queensland was the only undefeated team. Yeah. Okay. There the you Dragons, go. Didn't the Dragons do them 38-0? I don't know. Uh, you know what? I'm going to go on. I'm going to keep going on this positivity train, and I think we're going to win. I think we're going to come up here. Even though it is a five day turnaround, sometimes that's actually not a bad thing. You've got a little bit more of that energy from the win, especially if it's off a win. So I think we're going to win, and I think we're going to put a bit of a, a score on them, but I think they're going to match us on that as well. So I think it's going to be like 32 to 22. Okay, cool. <laughs> I've got egg on my face, eh? Hey? Yeah, <laughs> I said did. the Dragons did them 38-0. They did, they did the Dragons 38-0. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, they flogged the Dragons. Sorry, Dolphins fans. Now, the Cowboys put the cleaners from 43-18 in round one. So they're, they're on a three-game winning streak, which is pretty good. We're on oh, a two. No, yeah. Yeah, true. Yeah. All right, mate. So you said, sorry, 32-22. To us. Yep. Okay. I think we're good for about three or four tries, but I don't think we're good for much more than that at the moment, um, particularly without Galvin. Uh, I just see Galvin as the ability to create points, so I think we're going to have to probably grind out a couple of games um, coming forward before we blow anybody off the park. Uh, so for me, it's going to be relatively low scoring. I'm going to say we score 22, 22-18. It's going to be tight again. We're going to get them just. Uh, but it's not going to be a walk in the park. I don't think we have to, we're going to actually have too many games this year that are going to be easy to watch, which is just par for the course with the Tigers. But I just think with where we're at, we're going to have to turn up and show what we've shown in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but hopefully we actually get the jump on a team would be nice because we've had to come from behind in three consecutive games. Uh, no, that's not entirely true. Uh, sorry, against Para, we obviously got the jump, but then we did have to come from behind later in the game. So... Yes, it would be nice to have a flow of possession and the run of possession for the duration of the game and finish the game with 55% and have a lot of territory. That would be nice, but we'll have to wait and see. So 22 18 for me. You got a bold prediction? I think he's come back to, to Brisbane, so I'm going to say that um, Far Tape is going to get his debut try this week. Yep, sure. That's a good one. Uh, I'm going to say Bud's going to play well and he's going to have two try assists. Yeah, yeah, wouldn't be bad. Well, about it. I'll I'll retract part of that. I'm not going to say he's necessarily going to play well. I don't think he's going to. I think he's going to have two tries here, but I don't think we're going to be talking about him 
being stellar. I think he's just going to contribute in that regard. But yeah. I am very excited to see Latu play, definitely. And I think, I I think every, everyone that knows you knows that you are. Yeah, I'm a big fan. All right, mate. Any more to add on the Dolphins game on the weekend before we jump into our PSAs and wrap up the show? No. All right. Two podcasts, we always say, do things as well as us. The West Life Podcast and the West Tigers Podcast. You can find them on all your favourite platforms. You know where to find them. You know where to find us. When you go over there, tell them who sent you. The blokes from Tiger Town Podcast. Please. Big, th- big thanks to our sponsors. Best on Grand Digital. Best on GrandDigital.com. The digital marketing agency that looks after the little guys. They look after us. They'll look after you too. Best on GrandDigital.com. They will not steer you wrong. You can find us. YouTube, Facebook. I nearly said Twitter. That's not Twitter. It's not X. We might be on there one day. It's a bit of a cesspool, Maybe. though. Uh, Spotify. What else have I left out? Instagram. Yep. That's where you'll find us. Uh, you've probably already found us, but if not, please recommend us to somebody else. We'll jump onto one of the other networks if you haven't already and follow, subscribe, all that good stuff. Send us a message. Message. Send us DMs. Send us whatever you like. Uh but yeah, nothing, nothing lewd, please. We're married men. We, we, uh, that's, we are that's family friendly. No matter how much that's we drop right. the F bomb, we're still family friendly. Yeah. We're a PG show with the occasional coarse language, but it's it's required if we're talking about referees, is it not? Uh, I think it's definitely required. Mate, we've given a shout out to the two podcasts we love. We've given a shout out to our sponsors. We've told everybody where to find us. There's only one more thing to do, my friend, and that is say, go the mighty two on the trot. Sixth place, West Tigers. Up the Tigers. I didn't care about last year. <laughs> this is now. <laughs> <laughs>